I start the recording right now. Uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, going to be a joint meeting uh, with the Welding Institute uh, and uh, Brian Bell, uh, the chairman of North Scottish branch of the Welding Institute is with us. Uh, he will have uh, also a short introduction after this for TWI. Uh, the slides of the presentation will be available after the uh, after the webinar on uh, ICOR website uh, and the recording will be on, available on the YouTube channel. Uh, please note that if you have any question from our presenter today, uh, you can ask it in the Q&A uh, section. We have chat and we have Q&A. Please uh, put your question under the Q&A. Dr. Oli, uh, who is uh, vice chair of ICOR Aberdeen, uh, he's with us and he will take uh, the questions after the presentation. Uh, so, as you have already seen in today's uh, event flyer, today's presentation is by Sonomatic uh, regarding their robot, uh, sonar robotic storage tank uh, inspection. Uh, it will be presented by uh, Matthew Bitti, uh, who is actually joining us from Canada tonight. Uh, he is Global Advanced Robotic Application Manager in Sonomatic. Uh, so before, before we start with presentation, because this is our first formal event of the year, uh, for ICOR Aberdeen. Uh, I want to give you a brief summary of ICOR Aberdeen uh, program for 2021 and 2022. It will take uh, uh, six, seven minutes, and then uh, Brian will uh, continue with the short uh, introduction for TWI. Uh, so first of all, I would like to thank all uh, our uh, branch sponsors uh, who have kindly supported us uh, regularly and uh, this has enabled us to keep all our monthly meeting happening without any gaps for the last several years. Uh, we really appreciate that. Uh, also, I would like to thank uh, Aberdeen branch committee members who have supported branch and myself in uh, arranging all our uh, events throughout the year. Uh, this photo is from one of our last in-person meeting we had uh, before pandemic. Uh, and since then, uh, we had a few new members, uh, Leon Lingbe, Steve Patterson, uh, Peter Furness, and Lila Ramachandran. Uh, so it's, it's quite a uh, strong and big uh, committee we have uh, with a lot of preparation that uh, needs to be done for the uh, for events uh, this year and preparation for the next year. Uh, so this is the structure, sorry the structure of the committee, uh, Aberdeen branch committee. Uh, myself as chairman, uh, Dr. Oli is with us as vice chair, uh, Dr. Nigel Owen as external secretary, uh, Ms. Lian Lingbe as internal secretary, uh, Brian Brin Robert, financial officer, Peter Furness as a sponsorship officer, Amir Atarchi as event coordinator, Lila Ramachandran as university liaison and CPD officer, Dr. Yunan Gao as a website officer, Mailing Che as membership and EAP coordinator, and uh, Dr. Steve Patterson as uh, young engineer program mentor and case study coordinator. Um, I also have to, I would like to take the opportunity to thank our immediate past chair, Dr. Mohamed Ejaz, not sure if he is uh, amongst the attendees today uh, for his wonderful uh, for the wonderful job he did uh, to to keep the branch active during the challenging 2020-2021 year. Uh, I have to say that the last year was one of the most successful year uh, for ICOR Aberdeen in attracting a lot of new uh, attendees uh, for our events. Um, internationally uh, all around the world uh, and uh, the today meeting shows uh, 
that this is this has been a very successful start last year because we had about 150 registration for today uh, meeting uh, at the moment 43 uh, has already joined from 26 different countries uh, uh, and Stephen Tate uh, who is vice president of ICOR uh, he's actually uh, at the moment uh, acting as the observer, Alistair Seton and Zahra Lutfi also as observer and sabbatical at the moment. Uh, so uh, as I said, uh, the presentations of, after the event, after the webinar, they will all go to the website. All the presentation and slides, you can go back uh, until 10, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, they are all available. Uh, it's PowerPoint or PDF. Uh, uh, or, and images and the uh, photos of all the events, you can, can refer to them on, on the ICOR um, website in Aberdeen branch uh, uh, page. Uh, and also the YouTube channel, you can watch the previous recordings. Uh, so, so the, the year, the, the, the program for the 2021-2022 is already uh, completed, uh, ready, and we are going to start, uh, we, we have already started actually from August uh, last month uh, with annual cohesion forum, which was the first face-to-face -face meeting after more than a year uh, that happened in, in track oil and gas. Uh, the rest of the events will be kind of hybrid. Uh, we will have all the events until the end of the year as virtual, but we'll start our face-to-face -face meeting from uh, January 2022. Uh, but uh, I have to say that we are planning to record all of the uh, even face-to-face uh, -face meeting. Uh, we are planning to do a live stream session. Uh, so <clears throat> we can have questions uh, from the audience at the same time uh, if they are joining us uh, online. And again, the recording will be available uh, uh, after the events. Uh, so this is the program for 2021, 2022. Uh, um, so the August uh, session already done. Uh, the link uh, is available in the program. You have uh, already probably received this program by email if you are registered uh, with us. If not, please send us uh, an email to anybody in the uh, ICOR committee, uh, so we can add your uh, uh, email address uh, to uh, to the uh, recipients. So uh, you will receive the program and the invite for the future events. Uh, the next uh, event will be 26th of October uh, from University of Calgary, Professor Frank Chang, uh, about internal corrosion of pipeline. Uh, we'll have last in uh, meeting of 2021 in uh, November, uh, a joint meeting with IOM3. Then we'll have a break in December and we'll restart from January with a joint meeting with Energy Institute uh, from University of Leeds. Uh, and then uh, in February, we'll have a, a presentation by Intertech Production. And in March, we'll have a presentation by Dr. Robert Lindsay from University of Manchester. Uh, and we'll have at the same uh, month uh, in March, an industrial visit to Stork. So this is very limited for uh, probably 20, 25 people. Uh, so it will be first come, first serve. Uh, we'll, we'll send you the announcement uh, later when uh, the date is confirmed. So you can uh, start registering for that. Uh, in March, also, we have uh, our first foundation, uh, fundamental of uh, corrosion engineering course. It's a paid course, actually, but again, very limited, uh, maybe for eight or 10 people. It's an uh, in-person uh, course uh, happening in Aberdeen for a full week. Uh, and uh, you can start registering from now. Just uh, contact us if you, if you want to uh, do that. Uh, in April, we'll have our joint meeting with NACE, uh, which is presentation by Preserve. And in May, uh, which is our last session of the 2021-2022, we'll have our AGM and a presentation by PIM, uh, Martin Worth. 
so this this is the 2021-22 program. Uh, there are other uh, events happening at the same time, uh, like our joint event with MCF, which is like weekly webinars. Uh, so those will be uh, announced later as well. So as you see, this is a full uh, uh, monthly program. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have a very exciting uh, event happening this year for the first time in, in Aberdeen, uh, Young Engineering Program. I already have uh, uh, sent announcement uh, on LinkedIn and by email, so you might have received that. So I have to say this is only applicable for people uh, based in Aberdeen or the Aberdeen catchment area. Uh, and uh, it's a free uh, kind of course for a full year for young engineers or people who are in their early stage of uh, their career. Uh, related to integrity management or corrosion engineering. Uh, it's a very good opportunity for them to achieve their MI core or charter engineering status with its, uh, and their career development. Uh, uh, we have already started uh, uh, registering for this. 20 people will be selected uh, for this program and uh, they will go through a full year of uh, uh, corrosion engineering related lectures. Um, on a monthly basis from January to November. Uh, it includes material, catalytic protection, welding, coating, COI, RBI, FFS, chemical treatment, NDT, and corrosion monitoring and presentation skills. And uh, in the middle of this uh, course, we will have a case study uh, presented to them, and they, they are supposed to work on the case study with their mentors. They will be split into five teams and each team will be assigned with a mentor. The mentors are actually very high level uh, uh, technical managers, lead engineers, or technical authorities from various companies. And they're leading the team throughout these uh, five, six months to prepare their case study and present the case study in November in front of a panel of judges. And the reward for that, for the winning group, will be that they will be sent to uh, NACE or AMPP conference in 2023, uh, all travel and accommodation and uh, conference fees paid. This, this is some, some photos from 2018 uh, and 2020 happened also online. And this is the winning group from 2018. So it's, it's very exciting uh, program. Uh, if uh, yourself uh, based in Aberdeen or catch, Aberdeen catchment area, uh, and interested to attend this, uh, contact myself or, or anybody from the committee. Uh, or if you know anyone uh, in your company who is interested to do that, please uh, uh, let them know. Uh, uh, so that's my introduction. Uh, with that, I will ask uh, Brian uh, to do an introduction to Building Institute. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Brian Bell. I'm currently chairman of the North Scottish branch of the Welding Institute. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so welcome, added to um, humans. Um, welcome to North Scottish branch and Highland and Islands branch members and anybody else that's joined from Welding Institute. A welcome from us to the Institute of Corrosion members as well and anyone else who has joined. Um, the next meeting, this is the first webinar of this season, as is I course, uh, but would like to say many thanks to all who supported the branch through the difficult times of COVID-19 and hope you continue to do so. It was a very successful programme last year. We have a full programme this year, so we hope we get the support we did last year. The next meeting is on October the 28th, two days after I core, and it's Daniel Sadana talking about his pipelines. The November meeting again, two days after I call is on the Thursday, November the 25th. And it's an interesting presentation by Glenn Byrne of World Alloys entitled, Interesting and Unexpected Project Experiences with Super Duplex Stainless Steels. Um, he owns the copyright to everything he's presenting. So he is going to present some uh, interesting experience that uh, doesn't normally make the open literature. Next slide, please. 
um, for registering for TWI events. <coughs> Two ways for North Scottish branch organised events, you can register via the Scottish, North Scottish, sorry, web page or by the TWI events web page, both of which are Google searchable. Members will be a link for the link to register, but uh, anybody can go onto those two websites and register. Important thing, when you register, you get a new link to join the webinar. The first link is not the joining the webinar, it is only to register. Uh, for joint events like tonight with other institutes, these will be posted on the same two web pages and members will again be emailed a link, but this time to the relevant institute registration. So tonight it was ICO. <clears throat> we hope, like ICO, to get a North Scottish branch LinkedIn page where events will be posted. We will advise when this is set up, we hope soon. Um, we have a very active branch committee elected at uh, the AGM, but we are keen if anybody else wants to join in particular, a younger member, because there is a vacancy for younger member rep, both on our committee and on the TWI Younger Members Committee. <coughs> Excuse me, next slide, please. Uh, this is the committee for 2021. If you recognize any names, contact them if you've got any questions. Um, on the TWI North Scottish webpage, you will see it. Um, Unfortunately, that is going to change soon. So if you uh, bookmark it, you'll have to keep looking at the uh, events webpage or the TWI North Scottish webpage to get the new email address. Uh, basically, TWI is given branches unique um, email addresses. So I say we have a very active committee. We have a full program for this year. We've only shown the ones for 2021. So. Uh, if, uh, as I say, if you're at all interested in joining the committee, please contact any of the committee that you may recognise. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our presenter today. Uh, so you should have already received the flyer and. Uh, our presenter today is Matteo Bitti. Uh, he's Global Advanced Robotic Application Manager in Sonomatic. Uh, uh, Matthew has several years of experience in advanced NDT applications and solutions on power generation and oil and gas assets. He is now uh, the Global Advanced Robotic Applications Manager for Sonomatic and responsible for the development and application of robotic inspection technologies, primarily used in uh, atmospheric storage tanks while they remain in service. Matthew has managed a team of inspectors on many successful robot deployments in service as atmospheric storage tank inspection projects uh, around the world. Uh, before uh, I invite Matt to start his talk, uh, Matt, uh, has asked for a poll. Uh, I'm running this the poll now for a minute uh, to understand about your opinion about uh, this question. So Matt will uh, build on this during his presentation. So I'm launching the poll and will share with you the results. Thirty people replied out of fifty one. We have 36 answers and still going. 
going up. If you can please finish in next few seconds so I can share the results. Okay. Okay. So the result is showing that, uh, so the question of what type of products can in-service robotic tank inspection operate in? And uh, the answer is water, condensate, crude oil, all of the above. So 84% responded all of the above. And the next uh, uh, answer is 11% water, 3% condensate and 3% crude oil. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, with that, I will ask uh, Matt uh, to share the screen and start his presentation. All right. Thank you, Human, human for the <clears throat> introduction. My name is Matthew Beatty. Um, I am the um, Robotics Applications Manager for Sonomatic, and today we'll discuss our uh, in-service storage tank inspection capabilities. Um, and for the question, um, everybody uh, is, is correct. Uh, we can inspect in any one of those products. Uh, and later on in the presentation, we will uh, go through some case studies on some crude oil storage tanks that we have inspected in service. Okay, Sonomatic is um, a part of the CWL group. The CW, CWL group is a uh, global group of companies uh, concentrating mostly on integrated access and inspection solutions. And the objective of uh, an in-service robotic tank floor inspection, um, what we are trying to do is assess the tank floor condition while the tank remains in service. So we're looking for uh, product side corrosion, soil side corrosion. Um, we will, uh, the aim is to uh, run across the tank floor, uh, hitting as many plates as possible and collecting ultrasonic data um, to then assess the condition of the tank floor and then come up with a remaining useful life of that tank. What our capabilities are, uh, desludging and waste management. So we do have the capability to actually remove sludge inside of the tank. Um, that has pretty much um, come into play almost immediately when we created the division because the uh, ultimate goal is to have a clean surface for the ultrasonic data so we can collect good and reliable uh, data. So we do have desludging um, capabilities. We can either pump the sludge away from the robot, keeping it inside the tank, or we can actually remove that sludge from the tank, uh, put it into filter bags, and then put the fresh product back into the tank. Um, our inspection consists of uh, tank shell and roof inspections, um, assessing the condition of the shell and roof. Uh, we do annual plate uh, inspections, uh, which we are uh, screening the annular plate to determine the condition of the annular plate prior than to putting the robot into the tank. Uh, we do shell the floor welds using um, phase array technique. We do the robotic UT tank floor inspection using our uh, wide range of robots to assess the tank floor condition. We can do internal visual inspection, which is obviously dependent on what product we're inside. And we can do settlement surveys. The primary um, the, what we're looking for with the robot, the primary uh, uh, result is the thickness of the tank floor. Um, so that's the main 
reason for the robot going inside the tank while in service, and we're keeping the tank in service while we're doing this inspection. Um, we usually, like I said, we usually look at what percentage of the tank we're going to inspect and then use a statistical analysis uh, to determine what um, the minimum thickness of the rest of the tank would be. Uh, we use SRUT and PAUT, uh, short range ultrasonics and phased array ultrasonics. And um, we can also do acoustic emission testing, which will scan the tank for active corrosion prior to putting the robot inside the tank. The short range ultrasonics will be um, conducted from the outside of the tank, um, saturating the plate with uh, ultrasonics and then getting the results on that. It's a screening technique, um, which we will then use the robot to quantify if we have results. And the phase array weld inspection is also done from the outside of the tank, looking at the uh, shell to annular plate welds. This is the range of robots that we have. We have um, a hydraulically driven robot, which is the top left uh, picture. This one is for heavy hydrocarbons, such as crude oil tanks. Uh, when we go through the case studies later on, this will be the robot which has conducted those inspections. Um, and then we have a variety of other robots for lighter hydrocarbons or water. We have um, a mini ROV swimmer, which we use mostly in water tanks um, to gain access to exactly where the robot is inside the tank. This is a video of um, one of our robots, which can also go into light hydrocarbons. And this is just showing how the robot works inside the tanks. The video on the right is given an example of how we're using just a scraper on this robot to scrape away the settlement um, on the tank floor in order to get uh, reliable ultrasonic data. Uh, this is another one of our robots. Um, this robot will fit through a 16 inch manway. <clears throat> And um, on the right hand side, that's the robot operating in diesel. And this is our hydraulic robot um, operating in a tank. Um, on the front of this one, you'll see a, um, a suction nozzle. Um, that nozzle in the front, <clears throat> right where that 90 degree elbow is, uh, that's what we would use uh, a pump with in order to clean the surface uh, prior to collecting the ultrasonic data. And again, this is the, um, the exact robot that we have used for the case studies I'll go through in a little bit. For our hydraulic robot, which will go into heavy hydrocarbons, um, we have an integrated um, operational safety systems, uh, which includes emergency shutdowns, nitrogen purge controls, LEL monitors, O2 monitors. Uh, we also uh, monitor the pressure of the nitrogen, um, as well as personal safety, such as uh, gas monitors on the roof. Um, what we monitor is we actually purge our uh, umbilical with nitrogen. While we're purging that umbilical with nitrogen, we're also monitoring the pressure of the nitrogen. Uh, and we're also monitoring the amount of oxygen inside that umbilical, which um, if any of those, if the pressure goes down too low, the system will shut down. Um, if the O2 readings inside the umbilical is too high, the system will shut down. We also put a temporary manway um, on, on top of the manway once we deploy. We'll put the temporary manway on, we'll seal that temporary manway, and we'll purge underneath that manway. And we'll also monitor that with pressure and uh, oxygen. Again, if at any time the oxygen raises too high or we lose pressure, um, 
the power will be shut down to the unit. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see a um, control box with uh, uh, green and red lights. Um, this is where we put all of our safety systems into. Uh, if any one of them are red, we cannot provide power to the unit. Uh, everything has to be all green and oper operating correctly in order for us to uh, provide power to the unit. For cleaning, um, we also have the uh, potential of removing sludge from a tank. So we can actually pump the sludge from a tank in service and we can pump it out of the tank and then um, we'll filter that material leaving just the sludge and we could pump the fresh uh, product back into the tank. So we have that capability. We can also inspect the same time while we do that. Um, depending on what type of sludge there is will depend if we can um, pump it or not. Um, so when we talk about the sludge in a tank, the sludge does have to be pumpable in order for us to remove that. The way we set up our systems is we have a 20 foot container uh, with our uh, HPU system, um, which is located about 10 meters from the tank shell. Um, we then um, connect our umbilical, well, we lift the robot up to the roof. Um, once the robot's on the roof, uh, we'll do a complete rooftop setup. On the bottom right-hand side, you can see the guys, um, they have the equipment set up and they're getting ready to deploy the robot into the tank. Um, they're on breathing air because that is a crude oil tank which they're going inside of. Um, we will then connect um, all of our components, such as our UT, our navigation, sonar, and safety components to the control container. And then we will launch our safety systems um, and wait until we get all green. And then we'll be able to power up the unit. The unit is never powered up while we're deploying into the tank. So once we get down to the bottom of the tank and we put the temporary manway over to cover and purge that area, that's part of our safety um, components, which needs to be green and acceptable in order for us to turn the power on. So at no point in time would we be able to get power to the unit, unit until the robot's on the ground. This is the field deployments. So um, on, on the left side, we have, um, again, um, another image of guys deploying the uh, hydraulic unit into a crude oil storage tank. Underneath that is the temporary manway cover, um, which I've been uh, explaining. That then seals the umbilical inside the tank. We purge that with nitrogen and we monitor that nitrogen pressure and oxygen. Um, and if there's a high amount of oxygen over 5%, the system will shut down uh, or we won't be able to have power to it. So uh, the oxygen must be less than 5%. And we have to monitor the pressure. So we have to make sure that we have pressure um, underneath the temporary man we cover with uh, nitrogen. The images in the center, um, this is a uh, sonar images, which um, we use sonar on the robots to determine obstructions inside the tank. And we also use it for sludge levels inside the tank. So if you look at the top left, you can see where um, the robot's dealing with some sludge, the robot's going through some sludge. And this is how we indicate um, what we're dealing with inside the tank and how to deal with um, that sludge. On the right hand side, um, this is uh, an example of how we would cover the tank. Um, so we're looking at a full coverage, meaning we're trying to hit every single plate inside that tank. Um, we can do 5% um, coverage, 10% coverage. Uh, it all depends really on um, what is agreed with the client, and then we'll develop a scan plan um, and, and carry out the inspection. Uh, ultrasonic probe types. So this is how um, 
in the last five years, we have been uh, advancing our ultrasonic capabilities. We used to use just uh, eight uh, 10 millimeter diameter probes, which we have then um, created an array of those same probes. Uh, but we put 30 of those probes into one big array, which would give us more coverage, which would make the inspections quicker, um, which would make our data more reliable um, because we're covering a bigger area at once. And we have also gone to a uh, phased, phased array multiplex probe, um, which is 256 mm coverage, uh, which consists of 128 elements. Improvements on the system. Um, so in the last year or two, we've been um, really looking how to um, reduce inspection time uh, and how to um, reduce analysis time. Um, and we've come up with two solutions. One solution was what I just showed you, which is expanding uh, the coverage of UT. So we're collecting more data quicker. And another uh, aspect that we've introduced is um, a near real-time uh, data analysis software, which has reduced our data analysis by about 75%. Um, this data analysis software um, receives the data collected from the ultrasonics, and um, it is run in parallel with the inspection. So as soon as we collect that scan, it's already being processed for us. So at any given time, if we do see corrosion, such as the bottom right hand um, image, we will know very quickly that there's an area with corrosion that we would wanna concentrate on a little bit more and we can actually go back to that area and, and continue to do that inspection um, at a higher resolution if we had to. This is, um, the um, validation of the uh, phase array multiplex probe on an API plate, which just shows that we have done uh, an invalidation on on a API plate. This is an uh, example of um, one of our case studies. We um, completed the inspection of an 80 meter crude oil storage tank, which had a 60,000 barrel capacity. And we completed this while the tank remained in service. Um, this was, uh, this tank, specific tank was in service since 2002. Um, and when we went into uh, this tank, we have already known um, by the client that there were similar tanks um, that was showing some corrosion. So we were expecting to find some type of um, corrosion inside this tank prior to going in. And we also knew that there was also the potential of internal and external corrosion in this tank. So once we gathered this information, we came up with an inspection plan for this tank, which we collected 5% um, of the total floor area. So we collected 5% um, quantifiable um, ultrasonic data. We then um, ran analysis on that data and then took that, uh, took the results and ran it through a statistical analysis um, to find out what the probability of the lowest thickness measurement of that tank would be. Um, we also did screen this tank with uh, short range ultrasonics, which screened the annular plate. Um, and we did do acoustic emissions uh, testing before um, deploying the robot to assess the tank floor and see if there was any active corrosion. We then took those two results and um, we concentrated on what areas were potentially uh, of concern um, from the SRUT and the acoustic emissions, went into the tank, did our 5% coverage, and then uh, came out. Inside this tank, um, there was um, substantial cleaning required uh, for this specific tank. Uh, we used our suction and discharge nozzle on the front of the robot 
to pump that sludge away from the robot. So we just displaced the sludge in this tank. We did not take it out of the tank. We just di displaced it so that we had a clean surface to do the inspection with. And then we also have a rubber scraper. So once the product is pumped from the uh, front of the robot, we have a rubber scraper with it, which then scrapes any residual um, sludge that's on the surface. And then behind that is where we have our ultrasonic uh, transducers. This inspection used the uh, eight transducer method. Um, and we collected it on our MicroPlus system. Um, we collected a total of 521 scans on this specific tank, which again represented about 5% coverage. Um, we were using uh, high dynamic um, range data to be collected, which means we we're just using different uh, amplitude levels um, for each transducer. Uh, we then ran it through the SIM software gathered our results, and then conducted a statistical analysis on it. The minimum thickness measured in the tank uh, that we collected out of the 5% coverage was 4.8 mm. Uh, the nominal was 7 mm of the tank. So we did pick up some corrosion inside the tank. And then we used um, the Hoy's recommended practice uh, for statistical analysis. Um, and once we ran the EVA, uh, minimum thickness was then um, reduced to 4.6 mm. And the estimated 1% probability of a minimum thickness was 3.55 mm. This gave the tank a um, remaining uh, life of uh, two years. So we justified this tank for another two years before it had to come out of service for an out of service inspection. Uh, just about three years later, um, this specific client took this tank out of service, and uh, the results are as follows. Um, when we conducted the inspection in April 2017, we predicted that three years later, they would have a minimum thickness of 2.53 mm, and the out of service um, picked up a 2.2 mm, which is a difference of 0 0.3 mm. So this um, specific tank uh, and the statistical analysis um, was very accurate uh, in our point of view with only a 0.3 mm difference between the statistical analysis approach and the conventional out of service approach. We did another um, crude oil tank. This one was a 78 meter crude oil tank. This one was conducted prior to um, the case study I just went over. So this is a separate case study. Um, so we did the inspection on this tank. Uh, one year later, uh, the tank was removed from service. Um, and again, we were within 0 0.6 of an mm um, accuracy compared to out of service. In summary, um, when we're looking to, uh, and we're speaking with clients in regards to uh, inspecting a tank in service, um, we're normally looking at tanks where clients have determined that there is uh, an unlikelihood for the need of repairs, or they're not expecting a lot of corrosion inside the tank because the ultimate goal is to deploy the robot in service to a tank, which the clients um, believe do not have uh, significant um, corrosion inside the tank. So we wanna keep that tank online as long as possible. So when we're looking at tanks, are we, we're not looking for tanks that have high corrosion, we're looking at tanks that have lower corrosion um, so that we can give them um, more years of their tank without taking it out of service. Um, and that's it for now. I, I'll, I'll go quickly through um, what we've been doing. Um, so since 2017, um, I've kind of went through everything. 
uh, of what we've done. So we did inspect the crude oil storage tank in 2017. We have improved our emergency shutdown systems uh, through uh, redundancy inside our systems. So our systems uh, also have redundancy um, to make sure that the equipment is working uh, properly all the time. Um, in 2021, this year, we, uh, we inspected a 100 meter crude oil storage tank. Um, and we have been working on collecting higher percentage of um, the tank floor. Uh, and then we have been doing that through um, increasing our um, ultrasonic collection. What we're looking forward to do for the next five years, um, again, we're gonna continue to um, concentrate on uh, improving floor coverage, uh, higher resolution data, uh, right now, we're at partially automated data analysis, and we're looking to go into fully automated data analysis. Um, we're um, continuously uh, increasing our um, pumping capabilities um, for higher sludge levels. Um, we have the capability to pump, pump about one meter of sludge. Um, again, that's dependent on if that sludge is pumpable. Um, we're also um, in discussions about an automated uh, launch system uh, of our robot. Um, and the idea behind this is so that we can set up this launching system on the roof. Um, the idea is to, to eliminate personnel being on the roof whenever the manway is open. And then we're going into potentially um, autonomous software. Um, just to get better accuracy of where we are in the tank and um, increase our ultrasonic capabilities. Okay, and if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer them. Uh, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, let me see if Dr. Oli. Yeah, he's back. Yeah. Oli, are you okay to take the questions? Yes, I'm okay to take the questions. No, I'm, I'm asking Oli. Uh, oh, sorry. I think his microphone. Is not probably working. Okay, no problem. I will ask the questions myself. Okay, so the first one is uh, from Kamal Ayi Tayo. Uh, I think he's, he's asking just a question from TWI. I will uh, send this. Maybe uh, Brian, uh, can you uh, answer this question? Yeah, uh, events for TWI are published on the website approximately three weeks before the event. So the ones for October will be on the website for the first week in October. Okay, thank you. We don't get the registration too early for obvious reasons. And uh, if you check the uh, TWI North Scottish website, um, three to four weeks before the uh, presentation, which is always the last Thursday of the month. Thank you. So uh, the first one here is from Stephen Tate. Uh, many thanks, Matthew. The robots are clearly very advanced and multitasking. Although there are many alarm controls, there may be some occasions when inspections cannot be completed fully. What is the most common reason for having an incomplete inspection. Okay, Stephen, thank you for your question. Um, I think there is um, more reasons um, um, that we potentially might not be able to complete a tank, um, but I think the most common reason would probably be uh, unpumpable sludge. Um, so the harder that sludge is, um, that it won't be pumpable, we can't remove that sludge. 
Um, and once we have sludge underneath the ultrasonic transducer, it makes it very, very difficult to collect uh, useful data, um, which is how uh, we look at it. Um, we need to have very good data. Um, sometimes we can go through sludge, but it, it does affect the UT. So I think sludge, uh, unpumpable sludge would probably be uh, a reason, um, as well as internal obstructions. Um, so we would have to review uh, what kind of obstructions are inside the tank prior to going in to determine what kind of coverage we can get. So those are two that come off the top of my head right away. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is from uh, Huzur Box. Uh, what are the limits of H2S while running robot in sovereign environments? Okay. Um, thanks for that question. And um, currently, um, the way that we view H2S is we don't want any H2S. Um, once we start looking into H2S levels, um, we usually um, determine, uh, we'll usually get off the roof because we have had some instances where uh, we ran into H2S. Um, and we've got off the roof uh, and then came up with a plan uh, how we were going to deal with that, uh, whether it was leaving the um, manway open to let that vent uh, before the guys went onto the roof. Our objective while we're on the roof is to have zero H2S. Um, and that's mostly a um, coming from a um, personal safety standpoint. Okay, yeah, thank you. So another question about safety then. What are, uh, by Wilfred Afor, what are safety precautions taken in the deployment of the robot in floating roof tank having production? Okay, um, safety precautions um, for, okay, floating roof. So when we're on the roof for a floating roof tank, um, number one, there's absolutely no power to the robot. Um, so that's that's safety number one. Uh, if we're talking about a um, crude oil tank, um, the uh, personnel in the tank will be under SCBA uh, with continuous um, with continuous air. Um, our tools, we use brass tools on the roof um, for deploying the robot. Um, and our system is completely grounded, and it's uh, proven to be grounded prior to deploying the robot. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is by David Corbett. If you are inspecting from inside the tank and have internal corrosion on the tank floor, how do you confirm the wall thickness? I believe uh, you would need a specific surface condition for the probes to give you an accurate reading. What surface condition do you require? Yeah, so the surface condition is as clean as possible. Um, so that's why we use um, our pumping capabilities uh, to make that surface as clean as possible. So um, it's a very good question because I, I didn't mention the fact that our pumping, um, it's not just suction for pumping. We can also discharge clean fluid in front as well. So if we're finding it hard and we're finding a lot of topside corrosion, which might have some uh, sludge um, which settled inside that corrosion will actually um, discharge clean product from above the robot through our pumping system and we'll try to blow out those areas so that we can get better and accurate readings. We use a, um, a um, product gap technique on our ultrasonics. So um, the ultrasonic probe floats above um, the floor um, and depending on the thickness of the material that we're inspecting will depend on what that product gap is, but we usually go anywhere from about 30 mm to 40 mm uh, with that water gap standoff. Yeah, thank you. The next question is by ADCG and Jury. Uh, he's asking, how does the system differentiate between corrosion from within the tank, means on the tank floor, to corrosion occurring beneath the tank on the soil side? Okay, yep, this is, um, so we, we can see this inside our uh, B scans. So once we collect the data 
um, will have B scans, which are nice straight B scans across the screen. And if we have top side indications, the um, B scan will be affected from the top side of that. Um, so the interface signal will actually dip in, um, we'll, it'll dip down and that will indicate that we have product side indications. If we have soil side indications, that interface will stay straight and we'll actually get the indications from below the interface. So that's how we differentiate between top side and soil side. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is by Surya Mono, Monalori uh, and asking how the robot's position is being monitored and how accurate it is. Okay, so the robot has a navigation system, um, which is a uh, pitch and catch triangulation uh, type of uh, localization system, uh, which we will set up six transducers on the outside of the tank and we will have a pinging element on the robot itself. Um, and then those transducers will receive the signal and then calculate where it is in the tank. Uh, when we talk about how accurate it is, um, the smaller the tank, the more accurate. Um, the bigger the tank, um, there, it, it, it does become a little less accurate. Um, but let's say we were doing a 30 meter tank. Um, on a 30 meter tank, we could tell you within uh, uh, the size of a, a, a dinner plate of where you are. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, another question by Stephen Tate. Uh, I was wondering about installed sacrificial anode obstruction, obstruction and how you deal with it. Yeah, so uh, when we're dealing with uh, anodes inside the tank, um, it, it it can become an issue um, and it has become an issue in the past uh, where we have to be very careful with scan plans. Um, so when, when we deal with tanks that have a lot of obstructions um, is when we typically spend a lot more time with our scan plan phase uh, to determine where we're going into the tank. Um, so for instance, if we have a lot of obstructions and a lot of anodes inside the tank, uh, we might not be able to do it just from one manway. We might have to use all the manways that are acceptable to us um, so that we can get as much coverage as possible. <clears throat> I hope that answers your question. Okay. Hope so. Uh, thank you. Uh, Saad uh, Rafiq is asking, is there any specific qualifications required for robots, operators, or technicians? Um, qualificate for the robot operators, qualifications are done in-house, um, and it's a lot to do with, uh, on the job training. Um, so our operators will go through that. It's about a one to two year, um, on the job training, uh, program for the guys, uh, and the ultrasonic technicians are, um, they're level two technicians, uh, certified by, um, AST. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Keith Walton is asking, what is the biggest problem with the sludge that you encounter? Yeah, so the big, um, the biggest problem um, is usually when we start dealing with like a heavy paraffin wax inside the sludge. And I'm, I'm saying this specifically with crude oil. Um, it's usually when we can't pump it so um, when the viscosity gets too high on these uh, on the sludge, we, we can't physically pump that. We can't remove it. Um, we will ask um, to uh, potentially, we go around it with a couple different ways. So we wouldn't want, if that sludge is unpumpable, we wouldn't want the tank to be cold. So we would ask for uh, the temperature to be increased in that tank, which potentially gives us a, um, uh, a sludge that might be able to be pumpable. So that is our biggest uh, issue with sludge is if that sludge is pumpable or not. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, there are still a few more questions. Are you okay to stay a little bit more for five minutes? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next one is by Gilherm Virga. Uh, for a multi-tank in service inspection, what is the estimated time to move from one tank to uh, or site to the next one? 
including control room, robots, uh, etc. Okay, um, you're probably looking at a uh, full day for the um, hydraulic unit um, because we do have containers we have to pack down and get off the uh, roof and stuff. Uh, however, if we were going to be using one of our electric units for uh, light hydrocarbons or for water tanks, a um, couple hours. <laughs> So the next one is by anonymous attendee asking: Is robot is robotic system safe? Can critical area of bottom plate be scanned? And a multiple question: Any patents available for robots? Okay, uh, is the system intrinsically safe? Um, simple answer to that is no. However, we are um, actively investigating um, how we can get to to that. Um, intrinsically safe um, barrier. So we're, we are looking into that. Um, we have some um, some plans of how we're going to get there. So we are actively in that. But right now, no. Um, we do have a zone one, um, zone one division one cert for our uh, hydraulic robot. Uh, critical area of the bottom plate. Um, we can get within uh, two inches um, of the shell um inside the tank so uh we can't get any closer to two inches and any pa patents available for robots not no no okay thank you uh the other one uh, is any mechanism to check the thickness of coating or to check the coating condition especially in opaque uh, products like crude yeah, so um, our ultrasonic data would be able to assess um, coating condition. Um, when it comes to thickness of the coating, um, th that becomes a little bit more difficult, um, but we can tell you the condition of the coating. So if we're mm -hmm. missing coating, for example, we, we can determine if we're missing coating. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, then last one is by Vinuth. Rajendran asking, can we define the type of corrosion or only can measure the thickness of the plate? Yeah, so uh, we can look at, um, we're typically looking for general corrosion, um, but we can do pitting corrosion depending on uh, the size of the pitting. So there is limitations for sure, um, but we can pick it up if the um, size is okay. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, you're looking at um, a diameter of about five to 10 mil uh, for the pitting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just another one added by David Corbett. Have you used this on an offshore installation or are these examples all onshore based? I think I heard you saying a 20 feet container control room. Yeah, so that's that's correct for, for um Hydro, uh, for crude oil specifically, um, it will be a 20 foot container. Um, so when you're talking about an offshore facility, um, I don't know um, exactly uh, what kind of offshore facility you're talking about. Um, however, the two case studies that I went through, um, both of those were done offshore. Um, so those were do done offshore um, on an island. So we did ship, um, the equipment to the island, uh, and that was considered to be an offshore facility. Okay, yeah, great. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for asking questions, and thanks, Matt, again for this excellent presentation and interesting topic, uh, and going through the uh, answering the question in detail. Thank you very much, and thanks everyone for taking the time attending today. I hope that you find it of benefit. Uh, so just one thing, once you left the webinar, there will be a short survey that you can fill. If you need a CPT certificate, please make sure that you're filling the survey and responding to the CPT as yes. So we can uh, send you the CPT by email, certificate by email. Uh, please, uh, and as I mentioned, this, the slides and the video will be available uh, after the webinar. You can refer to that. The next monthly 
program, as I said, will be uh, the last Tuesday of October, which is 26, uh, by uh, Dr. Cheng from the University of Calgary. Uh, thanks a lot. And I can see that a lot of people thanking you, Matt, uh, for your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. And have a great rest of the day or evening. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you from Brian Bell at TWI as well, Matt. That was a very good presentation. And there's a lot of compliments coming in on the chat button. Great. Thanks. Thank you guys for the opportunity. And it was um it was very good. Good questions too, for sure. Yeah. Good questions. 17 questions. Yeah. So uh, uh we, we all we all we have recorded the questions and uh, probably if you don't uh, mind i can send you the question if you think that you want to answer them in more detail we can uh, we can uh, upload the question and answers as well to the presentation so for future reference great okay uh, that's i think all i can